So this uh, video is going to be about the concerto in the classical period. Um, you know, the first page is actually a really good summary of how the concerto has developed from the Baroque period. The biggest thing is that um, public concerts, um, where you would sell tickets and people would come, uh, gradually instigated the, the decline of the concerto grosso, which is a large group versus a small group of people playing the contrast of the two orchestras which was profoundly popular during the Baroque period instead now the solo concerto becomes um, the dominant concerto form and what that basically means is instead of a small group of players like we saw in the Brandenburg versus an orchestra we have an orchestra and a featured soloist which is probably more what you're used to seeing today if you have um, uh, friends or people that you know that have come up through um, music programs at school and they've done um, featured pieces with an orchestra or they're a soloist at solo and state ensemble or something like that. Um, so the demand for uh, concertos uh, grew for soloists because that was a way to draw people to concerts uh, to come see a superstar soloist and as a result the there's some aesthetic changes that happened to the concerto. I think the big one is that the soloist stands, usually, uh, unless they're a cellist, of course, and they, um, they're they given much, much more difficult virtuosic music uh, to play. Uh, again, this is all uh, part of drawing people to concerts to, to watch. Now, that being said, um, it's important to note that uh, most concertos that were written in the classical period were for piano and violin, which are the most ubiquitous and and um, prolifically played instruments during those times. But there were other uh, concertos. You can see a list, trumpet, bassoon, French horn. Uh, you know, any instrument almost could have had a concerto, but the majority were written for uh, violin and piano. Uh, now, your book has gone through some evolutions over the different um, I guess editions and they talk about the differences between what the the sonata form of a concerto in other words the first movement of the concerto usually concertos have three movements a fast a slow and a fast movement um, and the first one would always be sonata form and that's no different than a symphony first movement would always be a sonata form and we studied that in the last chapter but um, uh, this book talks about the differences between a sonata form for concerto and sonata form for all the other kinds of pieces of music that didn't feature a main soloist. And, and they did a pretty good job. They talk about what something is called the double exposition and a cadenza. Uh, they mention in here about extending passages and things like that. And, uh, and then they had a, a great example of all that so we could listen to it and go, oh, okay. Rather than three sort of points of general information, you could, you could actually learn it. In this edition, for some reason, they've gone away from that, and now they're featuring a recording of a second movement, which is good, um, you know, to have, but we have lost the recording of that. So what I'm going to do now is append to this video, um, a screen video, where I will review a, a more in-depth sort of uh, reading of what the differences in the sonata form for concerto first movement is compared to all other sonata forms for symphonies, string quartets, whatever, right? Um, and then we will do a listening guide taking you through an example of a concerto first movement so you can hear these differences. So I'll switch over cameras and uh, you'll get a, a document on my screen that you will be able to download and use for study as well. Let's talk about the three big differences between a sonata form in the first movement of a concerto versus the sonata form in the first movement of a symphony or a string quartet or a small ensemble sonata or something like that. Uh, it's basically the same. It will have an exposition and a development and a recapitulation and the exposition will have maybe an introduction, maybe not, but then it'll have a theme one, transition, theme two, transition, coda, a development section which um, you know takes the materials from the exposition and tries them out in different ways and in different keys and then a recapitulation which will be sort of like repeating the exposition except um, 
may have slight differences sort of to delight or thwart your expectations and the biggest thing is that it will stay all in the original key whereas the um, the exposition would change key signaling that we were debarking on sort of a musical journey um, so the three things that are different in a solo concerto all have to do with featuring the soloist the first one is called the double exposition it's right here on your document I've summarized a lot of what's in the textbook and sort of tried to make it clearer but here's the idea instead of having an exposition which may be repeated in many classical pieces it was just straight up repeated for balance uh, the first time through the exposition of a concerto uh, it'll just be played by the orchestra the soloist will be standing there waiting their turn but it's sort of introductory it introduces you to the themes that you'll be hearing played of course but it's a long extended introduction for the soloist so that you have this contrast and this buildup waiting for them we'll hear that in the recording that we go through then what happens is either um, you know, it just starts up again and repeats the uh, exposition again with a soloist on top, or more likely there's a short interlude between the end of the first time through the exposition with no soloist and then repeating that exposition again with the soloist. And that interlude features and is, is where the soloist comes in and plays for the first time. Um, we call this a double exposition instead of a repeated exposition. Again, first time, orchestra on its own, it's an introduction before the soloist plays. They'll take a pause and an interlude where the soloist will play something that's completely different, usually to introduce themselves, and then when they get that sort of introduction, musically speaking, done, they'll go back and repeat the entire exposition, but now with the soloist playing parts. Now, inside there, the second thing that's different is uh, when the soloist is playing on that second time through, and truly anywhere else in the entire of the concerto, uh, we're going to break the form a little bit. Uh, we're featuring the soloist, so it's not uncommon, in fact, it's, it's standard practice to write extended themes, extended passages, additional bits of music in every one of the subsections of these pieces of music, particularly in the exposition. So we'll see this again on the piece coming up, um, where you hear the theme the first time with the orchestra on the first um, exposition, but then when it comes back around with the soloist on the second time, uh, they'll play through that, but then it will continue to go before it gets the transition. Or completely extra brand new sections inside those mini sections will be introduced as new passages, almost always to feature the soloist. It adds length to it and um, gives you a chance to feel like you got your money worth because money's worth because the soloist gets to show off their tone, their intonation, their flair. Their, if it's a you know violin, it'll be you know vibrato. And, uh, and also delightful and uh, interesting extra passages of music, uh, also giving a contrast to the basic form. That'll go on throughout. Now, it's not clear where that's going to happen all the time, but that's part of the fun of the, because every concerto is different, right? But that's part of the fun of the concerto. And finally, I guess the last thing is, after we do the entirety of the first movement, so that would be exposition, uh, without the, the double exposition, exposition without the soloist, expo interlude, introducing the soloist, exposition with the soloist, and then a development section where the soloist gets to play and show off technique and, and explore different ways that the thematic material can be redone. Then we get back to the recapitulation. We go all through that, and just before the recapitulation, recapitulation is done or the end of the first movement, the orchestra is going to stop and the soloist will play what's called a cadenza, which is basically a big improvised solo on the themes and materials from that movement. Um, this is uh, where the soloist gets to be highly individualistic and play whatever they want, but usually on the themes and materials that they've just played with. It would be weird to see them do something completely different. Um, and then when the soloist is done, that cadenza or improvised solo right extended solo uh, the conductor of the orchestra will be cued somehow or just know what's going to happen and then bring in the soloist uh, sorry the orchestra to uh, play the last sort of phrases out um you know i've written in here that uh, a couple things if you're a beginning player you don't have to do an improvised solo somebody's written out a solo for you and you just play it if you're an intermediate player you have a written out solo, but you've got it memorized, so it looks like 
you're sort of playing it out on your own. And only the really advanced players who are good at this will actually make up solos in real time. Um, yeah, okay. So we're going to listen to um, the exposition and uh, the cadenza of uh, Mozart's uh, violin concerto number no. five in A major, the first movement. It's got all these examples in there. You have a link here in the page uh, where the audio I got this from is. It's a live performance by Nikolai Zinader's um, performance. I think this is in like 2016. Uh, it's a good performance live, and uh, you can see I have the video up right here. So the timings for this start at 46 seconds because he doesn't, uh, you know, there's coming on and, and, and all that. The orchestra doesn't start till 46 seconds in right there. Uh, so the timings are there, uh, but the audio that I provided you trims off those 46 seconds. So, uh, you know, you'll if you want to go to this link and just watch with these timings. What we're going to do right now is I'm going to... Um, I'm going to play the audio trimmed and the reason it's trimmed is not just to get rid of the beginning part but once we get to the development section for differences in in form and for our discussion we're just going to skip ahead to the cadenza at that point this audio uh will be available to you in addition to this video so if you'd like to try and go through on your own and listen that would be good um so i'm going to start this and then i'm going to go to our listening guide and highlight all the things and I want you to, that means I'll be talking over the music, which will be a little distracting, but I don't want you to go through the next six, six and a half minutes or so and not know what's going on. So um, before I start, remember there's a theme one, transition one, theme two, transition two, and coda, and that's the entire exposition. This is a double exposition because it's a, a concerto, so then there'll be an interlude, right? And then you'll hear the music start up again at the end of the interlude, which is the repeat or the second exposition of the double exposition. And in this listening guide, I've tried to highlight in the video seconds when things happen. Um, and then there's bold things here saying, oh, look, there's an extended passage or extra music has been added. Uh, and then at the very end of each of these timings, there's a comparison. And before we start, so I don't have to talk over all of this, if you see the original time we do theme one, it only lasts 15 seconds, but with added materials for the soloist to play, the first time he gets to play is 27 seconds. So we've added, you know, almost double the amount of time. In the transition, uh, the first transition was 18 seconds. The second time we do that with the soloist, it's 41 seconds. Uh, theme two is the same, but then transition two you know, the original transition to is nine seconds. We get, you know, 36 extra seconds, 45 seconds long of extra material that the um, composer wrote to feature the soloist. Um, yeah, and then we'll skip ahead. There'll be a silence and I'll point that out. And then it starts sort of getting into the cadenza and, you know, we can, we can look at that there. You were like, well, how is this aesthetically good. Remember, we're there to listen to the soloists to do amazing things and, and beautiful things. And so we want extra material and features for them beyond the basic exposition in this case, so that they can play. And, um, you know, if you want to put it into modern terms, when you see a film and then you see the director's cut, there's extended scenes, new scenes, deleted scenes added back in. Uh, we're right in the middle of a time with streaming where we're getting completely different recuts of, of old movies and things like that. Um, think of it like that, right? Bonus features on the second time through. Okay, here we go. I will try and talk only when necessary so you can hear uh, and, you know, pay attention to forms and things like that. That's theme one. And that's your balanced second phrase, which is classical. And here's your transition right there. And here comes theme two.
and in just a second, transition to. And here's the coda. And now, the soloist will enter playing an interlude. It's very different. It's a chance for the soloist to show off the great tone. Okay, we're just about to finish up this interlude and it will go back to the second of the double expositions. And you'll hear the orchestra playing what it did before, but the soloist will play a brand new counter melody over top of the theme. Theme one, counter melody on the soloist. And normally we'd be done, but we're gonna play a little bit longer here. And here comes the transition, that's the transition. And it should be over, but we're gonna go for a long time with extra music for the soloist to play. And we're still going to extend. Here comes theme two. This is the repeat of the theme two for balance. And now we're into the transition. And there's gonna be a lot of extra music here. Now, normally we'd be done, but there's going to be more and more. Again, to feature the soloist and show their capabilities. All right. And here's the coda, which is the ending. Coda means tail or ending of the piece. This is the end of the double exposition. And now the development starts and it's gonna fade to nothing. So in just a second, we'll have jumped ahead to the end of the recapitulation. Here we go. And we're just about done the first movement and like a very, very long solo. You see he's jumping around with different materials that he's played earlier and he's trying them in different pitch places and modifying them. He's changed it into the minor. And he's doing advanced techniques like double stops, playing two notes at one time. And 
I'm just going to point out now, because it'll be very loud later, that this performance is well coordinated, and you won't know that the cadenza is going to end. Sometimes they telegraph that. In this case, he doesn't. But all of a sudden, the orchestra will come back in, and you'll know that the cadenza is over. And there you go. And we're done, unless this restarts, which I think it will. I'll turn that off. All right. Um, yeah, so what should you do with this? I, I would almost consider just listening to this again and uh, going through. Uh, let's go through the hierarchy of things just before we finish this video. First movement of most multi-movement pieces in the classical period feature on it, you know, the form, sonata form. And that's got an exposition and a development and a recapitulation where themes are introduced and developed. That's the whole point of it. The exposition is, you know, maybe an introduction. We haven't seen that yet, but it can happen. Theme one, transition one. Transition one actually changes key and tells us we're moving on to a you know sort of musical journey. Theme two, transition to coda, which is the ending or tail of the exposition. Um, in most cases, that exposition is just repeated for balance and sort of like symmetry um, aesthetics. Uh, in the concerto, we have what's called the double exposition where the first time will be an introductory part without the soloist, and then on the repeat, it will be with the soloist. Uh, then there's a development section, uh, previous material done in new ways and new keys, and then a recapitulation, which is the exposition again, but we don't change keys. We might modify a few things a little bit, and we finish the first movement that way. And then we go on to other movements, slow movements, pick-me-up movements that sort of get going, and usually a big, fast finale at the end. We're actually going to talk about uh, the finale movement of concertos in the next lecture uh, next week. Um, so then the concerto has some differences, and the big ones were that we have the double exposition. Instead of just repeating the exposition, the first time is without soloist. An interlude can happen between there where the soloist comes in. Then you get the double exposition or the second time through with the soloist. And this is where uh, things will be modified greatly. Then it just depends on what the composer and the piece and what they're doing but we'll see extensions or new pieces of, or bits of music and passages of music in any of the themes or transitions, anywhere there can be more. And the whole point is, you know, we're writing a big, satisfying, extended, complicated and beautiful solo uh, for, the, for the artist to play for us. And, um, and then after we get through the double exposition and the development and the recapitulation, it stops. And uh, an improvised solo called a cadenza will be played by the soloist. And uh, that could be quite extended if they're uh, very good. Um, cadenza playing is a specialized, uh, absolutely a specialized uh, skill that you have to learn to do through uh, practice, study, and, uh, and repetition. At the end of the cadenza, the orchestra conductor will know what's going to happen because he's worked with the soloist or she's worked with the soloist a lot. Or the soloist will play something and look over and kind of pause for a second and coordinate, and then the conductor will bring in that person again. Oh, sorry, bring in the orchestra to finish that, that off. And that's it. It's a significant sound and, and shape and size differences from just a few sort of aesthetic or, or, or changes because you know it manifests itself on the note level differently. Mm, you should have this with you so you can study and understand. Uh, this audio I will also make available, but I highly encourage you, if you want to review for yourself, to go to the original um, the original YouTube video, because seeing it played live, seeing the physicality of it, uh, adds a whole bunch to, um, to the experience, I think. So, all right, good. We will talk to you next week when we talk about the last movement of a concerto, which is going to be in a new form called the rondo form. So we're done with sonata. We'll talk about rondo. We'll talk about 
later uh, theme and variations and uh, sort of bottle it all up and come up with a unit test next week. Uh, just as a final note, I, I did feature this whole unit as being about forms. Classical music is about hearing comprehensible, logical, and aesthetically pleasing forms. And so our job is to study this music uh, a great deal from what's going on in the form and can we hear the themes and distinguish them so we can tell where we are in the piece and understand the form. So, right?